intervention strategies, do we really need them for kids? And uh, I think it's something that every organization that has a pediatric group in it um, has struggled with at some point or another, certainly because it's uh, grounded in Accreditation Canada's um, ROP. So um, I am going to kick things off, and then we have a special guest today, Nida Deschamps from IWK, whose organization has done some great work around false prevention strategies that they're going to share. So I'm going to set the stage with um, uh, where things are going on at CHEO. Some of you might be able to relate to some of it because you'll see that while we've done a ton of work in the last three years, we've got a little bit more to do. Um, and so some may resonate and some may not. And then we'll hear about the great stuff that uh, Nita and IWK have been up to. So um, maybe without further ado, we'll just jump into the presentation that I will do for just a couple minutes. So, um, so just a little bit about uh, CHEO is what we'll cover. And then talk about our fall prevention strategy action to date and then where we see ourselves moving forward. Um, if you have any problems seeing this, this screen or anything, just uh, write a little message there on the screen to, um, to Lisa and she'll help you. So just a little note about CHEO. We are a freestanding academic uh, health center, so we are not a hospital within a hospital, but we're the regional pediatric hospital for eastern Ontario um, and sort of generally the Ottawa region. Uh, we're 165 beds have a good variety, 25 mental health, 20 level 3 and so on, um, uh, our NICU, PICU, and of course a, a, a significant amount of med surge beds. Uh, we have lots of special programs too, and um, that sort of colors things for accreditation a little bit differently, but we have a newborn screening program. We have a better outcomes registry for newborns. It's a provincial program, Center of Excellence for Mental Health, which is also provincial. Then we offer cardiac surgery, autism, eating disorders, and a new center for healthy, active living. And, and like many of you, have our research institute. Uh, in terms of volume, certainly more than 60,000 visits to our eMERGE every year. So a lot of work has been done around access and uh, using lean improvement. Um, over 100,000 ambulatory care visits to our clinics. And uh, certainly, we serve Eastern Ontario, Western Quebec. Uh, trauma programs in ICU, ED, and have other specialized pediatric services. And a little bit unique to us is that we actually also serve Eastern Nunavut. Okay, so let's just talk about fall strategies to date. At CHEO, when we went through our accreditation uh, survey in 2008, of course that was the first time we touched on the required organizational practices from Accreditation Canada, and those ROPs for patient safety, one of them of course included the uh, false prevention strategy that we needed to have. So I, I'll admit our first reaction was, oh, well, clearly this is something that's meant for the adult population, and we've got a, a good enough strategy in that we have a least restraint policy and the safe sleep policy, and we created signs that we put up in our ambulatory care environment, you know, and certainly falls that we were aware of were most often related to, in that environment, where people would plunk their kids up on the exam tables and then uh, turn their back for a second. So while we did see how it could be applied, I think uh, like many had sort of thought, well, this was an ROP that we had pretty much in hand. We also stated that, you know, we had metrics we were just putting in our, our safety reporting system at the time. So we identified that as something that we would be tracking and we felt that we, uh, that, that would be good. And we'd also offered some training around falls prevention, but I wouldn't say it's the one where we put all of our emphasis. We pretty much thought we had it in hand. We had our survey, and Accreditation Canada said, mm, yeah, no, not really. So uh, they really felt that we needed a much more structured strategy. And um, so we had to sort of go back to the drawing board. Just before I get too far along, though, I'll just pause and remind some of you about um, what Accreditation Canada was really looking for. So they, they, as I mentioned, they were looking for a falls prevention strategy. And so by that, they mean sort of a multi-pronged approach. You know, there's the literature and the science behind it, but there's also the education and the communication with staff and families. Um, they also wanted us to make sure we are identifying particular populations at risk for falls. Um, and I mentioned the ambulatory care one as one that we had given some thought to, 
um, but they wanted us to go a little bit beyond that. And so while we were thinking about the population at risk as being pediatrics in general, they were suggesting we look a little bit more specific. Um, and they felt that we are, and so in doing so that we would address the specific needs of the populations that were at risk. Um, they also wanted to, they want you to make sure that you're evaluating your false prevention strategy on an ongoing basis. Well, if our false prevention strategy was basically two policies and some signs, um, you can imagine that would be a little bit challenging to evaluate. And uh, the team used the evaluation information to make improvements to its false prevention strategy. So where the metrics had sort of played in, really in 2008, we, hadn't, we didn't have enough data quite at that point uh, to be able to uh, satisfy that part of the, uh, the test for compliance. So, um, so over 2008 to 2011, we just recently had our survey this past September for 2011. Um, we actually, after 2008, we said, oh, well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to bring in um, a, a communications expert and maybe go through a bit more of a really targeted promotional approach. But we stopped. And A, was, it was expensive, and we sort of really had to think about what exactly we were doing. It was surprising, actually, how far along we almost got with that before we decided to stop. Um, we stepped back. We looked at our falls incident data. I'll have to admit, though, it certainly was not our biggest category, nor is it now. And so there you sort of run with a bit of a, a challenge of this is an ROP, and yet out of all the ROPs that you'd really want to concentrate your efforts, this isn't one of them. It's probably more our medication ROPs. But um, nonetheless, Accreditation Canada had made this one actually a criteria uh, condition of our, um, of our accreditation status, so we had to get something together. We stopped and reviewed the literature. Although much is adult-based, there is pediatric work out there, so we had to look for and acknowledge that. And then we also spent some good time talking to some other centers and reviewing their policies in particular. OK. Oh, I'd love to go on, but hang on. Oh, there we are. So the first major thing that we did um, is that we adopted, uh, well, we were planning for an implementation to an electronic health record. That actually went uh, live in our inpatient areas in June, mid-June of 2010. So in the couple of years probably leading up to that, we were working with our software vendor and had an opportunity to incorporate what's known as the Cummings Fall Scale um, for false assessments. And this is, uh, had been validated in a pediatric environment. And so we decided to build that into our electronic documentation tool. So what's on the screen right now is um, a visual of what that sort of looks like when um, it's part of the, the risk assessments that would happen for, um, for inpatients only. And then it gives you a sense of what the categories are um, actually once you click on falls assessment. That was a, a big leap to even um, uh, build that into the system. And um, now the big leap is to ensure that it's actually still being used. So we've only been live on the system for just over a year. And um, it, it was one of the areas that we actually did an audit at the beginning prior to going live with the, uh, with the um, online tool and then um, have had an opportunity to do a post-implementation audit but then build that in as a, in our quality framework for doing unit-based audits. However, I would say that it's not one that is particularly well documented in spite of all of our efforts. Um, but that said, I, it's there, and it's, there's lots of opportunities for improvement in actually making sure that the risk assessment is carried out. But if you can just imagine going to a completely online and uh, documentation system in your in, inpatient area, um, this didn't rise to the top uh, for a lot of the other reasons of uh, needing to approve this one quite yet, but it is on the radar for sure. So at least now we have a means of um, evaluating how well the scale is used and what we could actually do moving forward, which is, which before it might have just been a requirement to do a false assessment, but there was no real strong um, ability to be able to evaluate in the documentation whether or not that had been done. So good positive first step, and the surveyor certainly liked it. We also um, really revised our documentation for what we give parents, families, actually, and staff. 
And so it's not just a sign that's up in the unit, but actually something that's given to staff. Um, and it's, there are a lot of our documentation for staff is what you need to know. So this is, um, we did a what you need to know for uh, patient faults. And you can sort of see a little bit about it. A pretty straightforward, simple, targeted, clear messaging. The third thing we did, and this was um, tying up the bit of a bow around it, was just putting um, it into policy format. And around our organization, if it's in policy format, uh, it generally uh, sort of gets a bit more of a, a consistent review at some juncture or another. So um, hence we did the creation of the patient policy strategy. This is just the first page of it. If anybody wants to see the policy itself, I'm happy to share. So moving forward, what's missing? So our, our 2011 survey that just happened, they really liked what had been done to date, but there was a big but. They felt that we need, still needed a specific strategy for particular populations. They focused this particular time on diagnostic imaging and ambulatory care. Now, the, one, the or, parts of our organization using the ambulatory care standards were our general outpatient clinics, our rehab clinics, and our autism program. And so we're moving on. So uh, what, it's interesting because we're, we're now kicking off focus groups with those three particular areas. And um, we'll take what we've done and build on it and uh, go to the actual uh, councils for those areas and get their input about what we can do to move this one forward in a way that's meaningful for those environments. I know that um, one of our uh, rehab folks has received some information um, on a possible tool that they can use to ensure that uh, during an assessment process in the outpatient environment, um, they're actually uh, assessing for risk of falls. One might say that when some kids in the, in the process of going through rehab might be expected to fall, and that's fine. Um, what our surveyors would say is they're expected to fall, so what are you putting in place to make sure that, they're, um, that their uh, level of their risk for them falling is assessed and then, then um, being able to manage the potential for that falling. So just the fact that they could fall doesn't mean you don't need some sort of an assessment. So, um, so that's kind of where we're at. I don't, yeah, I don't think I have any more slides. Just wanted to sort of let you know that we've sort of come from we don't really need a false prevention strategy a long way to yes, we need one and we still need to keep working on it. Um, and I would even venture to say that um, while we still don't have a lot of incidents, I can tell you that yesterday afternoon it was almost like karma as if um, Somebody out there knew I was doing this presentation because, sure enough, in our safety reporting system, two, in, two separate incidents were identified, in, one in diagnostic imaging and one of, in one of our ambulatory um, clinics where kitties had had a fall. And I just kind of thought, wow, you know, just when you think that you're starting to get things in hand, this is just reminding us that um, there's still lots of work to be done. So. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll probably take some questions after. So um, maybe at this point I will um, pass the screen over to uh, Nina and she will be able to, or Lisa, I'm not sure who, and we will move on to hearing this IWK part of the presentation this morning. Yep, we got it. Okay, my name is Nita Deschamps. I work at the IWK Health Center in Halifax. Uh, we are a pediatric uh, mental health and addictions and women's facility. We're a 265-bed facility. Um, and we uh, serve all the maritime provinces, including Newfoundland, PEI, Nova Scotia, and parts of New Brunswick. Um, Bear in mind, this is my first time doing this, so it feels a little strange not having an audience to speak to. So if I speak too fast or if I speak too loud, please let me know. So the question came up of, uh, do we need, uh, do pediatric facilities need a falls prevention program? And I thought what I'd do is I'd just take a look at an overview of falls within the health center. Um, and talk about the difference between children and adults. Uh, take a look at the, and review the IWK statistics and our falls prevention program, and why we need to have a falls prevention program within the ambulatory areas. And then take a look at the IWK's um, 
reporting as well as evaluation of the falls prevention program and review improvements um, where to go from here. Okay. So falls, we've done. A, there's been a lot of work and a lot of studies done for adult populations um, in terms of falls and falls risks. Falls in adults um, in patient populations account for a significant percentage of medical injuries that lead to increased hospital stays, pain, disability, unanticipated uh, treatments, and morbidity, increased morbidity and mortality. The hospital environment is very different from the home environment. Uh, due to a number of things, physiological factors, medications, toileting needs, the use of equipment, all leading to an increased risk of falls. Now, there have been a number of validated adult assessment tools to assess um, patients' risk of falls, such as the Morris, the Heinrich, Schmidt. But are these tools effective for evaluating the risk of falls in pediatrics? And they, uh, they Adult tools um, assess the risk for identifying um, uh, the risk for falls, um, including intrinsic and extrinsic factors. Those include uh, previous history of falls and gait or mobility disorder issues, cognitive impairments, medications, elimination problems. The ext extrinsic things include poor lighting, cluttered environment, um, the height of the bed, um, side rails, those sort of things. Okay. Now, in terms of children, so we have a number of validated adult assessment tools, but are they affected in a pediatric population in identifying patients at risk for falls? Um, as children have a greater opportunity and a propensity for fall, they're more active, they're more curious, their developmental age or stage, including their age, motor uh, skill development, should all be taken into consideration when they're looking at falls and fall risk. The adult assessment tools are a poor predictor of risk of falls for a pediatric population as, because they don't include things like the developmental stage, including their age and motor skills, uh, their cognitive development, um, their uh, activities that they engage in, um, and also any of the care, uh, caregiver presence or parental interactions. The other thing to take into consideration is that falls are very different. Um, uh, and the injuries that occur, occur from falls are very different in a pediatric population than in an adult population. And in adults, um, a fall it results in a greater harm than um, in a pediatric population. Most of the children who fall, there's not a great amount of harm that occurs. Some of the pediatric assessment tools, and I know Tracy had just mentioned the Cummings um, scale, the CHAMPS, Humpty Dumpty, the GRAPH, these are all um, pediatric assessment tools. Um, these tools do incorporate um, the developmental age and stage of the child. They also include mobility, um, patient and family education, and uh, risk factors in um, falls. In, at the IWK, we did not go with any a pediatric tool. Um, because we are a um, adult and child um, facility, we uh, wanted to go, for a number of reasons, we wanted to go with one standardized tool um, to standardize our documentation. Um, also, um, because a lot of the nurses work in both the pediatric and the adult side. Um, so. We wanted not to have two separate tools, but one tool. So we did develop, um, using both the pediatric tools and the adult tools, a, uh, an assessment record of our own. It's not a validated tool. Um, but it does include um, uh, the various major risk factors that um, for falls, like the history of falls, gait disturbances, any comorbidities, uh, mental status, environmental uh, issues, including footwear and clothing and elimination needs. There is, we do need to take a look at including age in the assessment and the activity level of the patient um, in our assessment record. And we will be making changes to that. Um, okay. Um, 
this is just a little bit of did you know. Falls are the leading cause of um, injury in children, and they account for 44% of our emergency room visits. We spend over $440 million every year in fall-related injuries. Having a falls prevention program in place increases staff awareness, okay, not only in terms of falls and fall risk and fall safety, but also in safety in general for patients. Um, it also helps us to identify those patients who are at risk for falls and helps us to put strategies in place to help reduce not only the number of falls but the severity of falls when they do happen. And it helps us to assist in tracking and trending of falls. Now, if you look at our data from the IWK, and I did remove the um, adult population data from here. So this is the data for uh, the last three fiscal years. In 2008-2009, we had 68 falls that occurred. And of those 68, 45 or 66 percent happened in the pediatric population. Um, and eight of those caused harm to the patients. And those included fractures or stitches. In the 2009-2010, we uh, implemented the falls prevention strategy or falls prevention program. Um, and what we expected was to see, and we did see, an increase in the number of reported falls because now staff are aware of what they need to report um, and what types of falls they need to report. And we were also hoping to see a decrease in severity. And we did see a slight decrease in severity um, during that fiscal year. In 2010, 2011, uh, we had 67 falls. Um, 52 of them um, happened in the children's um, side of the building. And if you can, and that's in 2010, 2011 is when we moved the falls prevention strategy into the ambulatory clinics, as well as into our 24/7 areas. And with the false prevention strategy in place, you can see that the number of uh, falls causing harm have been greatly reduced from seven in the previous year to three of this year. So in terms of um, statistical in, uh, the, at the IWK, we found that the majority of falls occur during the day that most of the falls occur uh, in the patient's room on the way to or coming from the washroom or bath or shower. We also, um, the majority of pediatric falls were environmentally related um, and had to do with environmental risks that contributed to the fa uh, pediatric falls, such as the height of the bed, um, the type of the bed, the side rails, um, whether they're up or down, chairs, playrooms, clutter in the areas. And what we found at the IWK is that most of the people who are falling or children who are falling are less than six years old with comorbidities. Um, and that most of the pediatric falls, over 80% of them, happen while the caregiver or parent were present. So the single most important preventative thing that we can do is educate our uh, families and caregivers in terms of risk of falls. And I just put this data in here because a lot of the other statistics and studies have shown that there's a high incidence of um, falls in children who are under four years of age who have comorbidities and who also have serious illness. And if you take a look at our data um, just in the last 2010-2011, hematology and oncology as well as our medical surgical unit that includes orthopedic patients and neurological patients are one of the highest uh, fall rates. So in 2009, April 2009, the IWK introduced a falls prevention program. And what that includes, the fall strategy includes, is assessing all inpatients for their risk of falls. And that is done, um, the assessment is done on admission as well as daily, uh, anytime there's a change in condition and on transfer. Um, and completing, if those children are deemed at risk for falls using the falls assessment record or scale, then an additional caution record is completed for um, that adds any individualized uh, strategies to help reduce their risk of falls. 
We also implemented a, a signage that goes over the patient's bed or on the patient's door that uh, alerts all staff to their patient's increased risk of falls. These are all in addition to the standard precautions for falls that we use. So after about six months, we did um, an audit um, to see uh, for compliance, first of all, just to make sure that everyone is um, filling out the um, assessment. And we found that it was 65% uh, compliance. After one year, um, notices went out to the managers to let them know what their, um, how their areas are doing. After one year, we had 95% um, 95 95 compliance. And we also included in that one year audit um, the accuracy, how accurate how accurate were they filling out the forms? And we found that there were some issues with that that required some education in some specific areas. Okay. In terms of the ambulatory areas, when we did our took a look at our data, we found that in the last three years alone, anywhere from 20 to 32 percent of the falls happened in ambulatory areas. And most of those were related to the environment, including furniture, toys, clutter in the environment, chairs with wheel uh, or wheelchairs, um, chairs with wheels in exam rooms, and that's where most of our, our ambulatory falls were happening. So we didn't want to include an assessment on every single ambulatory patient. I mean, some of our areas see 15,000 patients a year. Um, what we wanted to focus on was education to staff. Staff uh, education, we felt, was more important so that they are aware of what to look for, what are the risks. So we did a number of education sessions for all of the ambulatory areas um, that included our fall risks, um, fall data, and um, strategies to help reduce the risk of falls in their areas. We also um, wanted to make sure that um, patients and families were aware, so we created posters to put in all the waiting areas. Most of the falls that happened happened in the waiting areas um, while they're waiting to see the physician. So we created posters for those areas. Um, we also um, included uh, fall information and fall risks are included in our patient safety pamphlets, and most of those are those are mailed out from most of the ambulatory areas to uh, along with their appointment information so they have the information before they actually come to the uh, facility and we also included in our monthly workplace inspections uh, false risk assessment as well and our fall data and improvement activities were also included in our quarterly reports for the unit and when the accreditation did come, uh, we did have the accreditation in, in May of this year. And they did focus on the ambulatory areas. And they did ask, uh, they did ask to see our education packages that we had for uh, the ambulatory staff, as well as um, the posters and uh, the patient safety pamphlets. In terms of reporting and evaluation, so how did we get this information out to our staff? Well, all of our data on falls um, and fall-related injuries are reported on our AIMS, our online adverse event reporting system, which is an online adverse event reporting tool that we have. Our falls committee also reviews, and we have a falls committee that meets quarterly, and we review all patient, employee, and visitor falls and we make recommendations um, for, uh, to, for improvements. Also, our JOSH committee, our Joint Occupational Health Committee, um, reviews all employee-related falls on a monthly basis, and they also make recommendations. On top of all of that, we have a quality review committee, and we have 42 of them in our health center. Those are our morbidity occurrence mortality committees, and they review all patient-related falls 
uh, for their particular areas, and they make recommendations as well. So there's a number of different um, areas and places that uh, falls are reviewed within our health center. Um, trending and improvement initiatives are reported on a quarterly basis um, to the board and our KPIs, as well as on a monthly basis to our directors and managers. And all of our fall data is posted on our intranet, our pulse so that staff is able to see um, where the falls are happening and how many falls we have. Our Falls Prevention Committee is an inter interdisciplinary committee that's made up of physicians, OT, PT, pharmacy, housekeeping, and um, staff and improvement consultants. And they review um, falls uh, on a quarterly basis. Okay, so what have we done since then? Since uh, April 2009 when we started the um, falls prevention program in the inpatient areas, um, as I said, we've moved it and expanded it to the ambulatory clinics, um, as well as to all our 24-7 areas. Um, we've also made some changes to the policy. Um, we did create a, um, a falls prevention policy. Um, and we did include some, we have a number of long-term patients here in our health center as well, and we did omit the daily assessments for these patients. They are uh, assessed when they come in as well as after a fall or on a change in conditions. The other thing that we will be discussing and looking at at the next meeting in terms of our falls prevention committee is to include age as a factor um, within our assessment. And also we'd like to look at home care assessments. We have a number of um, people within our facility who go out to the homes and we want to expand that into the home care area as well. Okay, so where to from here? Well, I am part of, we do have in Nova Scotia a provincial um, falls committee that looks at, um, that has representation from all nine district health authorities as well as the IWK. And we have done a lot of things over the um, last year or so and are still working on in terms of standardizing things um, so that we're not reinventing the wheel. We have developed a standard education package for falls, um, but again, it's particularly related to adults and in particular elderly population. It doesn't include a lot of information on pediatric falls. So what we need to do is look at standardizing a learning package for pediatric falls so we're all learning from the same thing. The other thing, um, is that um, we, uh, this falls, Provincial Falls Committee is also looking at one Provincial Falls restraint, or least restraint policy, but again, it focuses a lot on um, the adult and elderly population. So as an IWK is the only pediatric-based facility, um, we're a little bit out of the loop in, in terms of that. There's a lot of great information that's going on, but a lot of it is geared toward an adult population. Uh, we, I did participate in the Falls Prevention Learning Collaborative with Safer Healthcare Now, and there was a lot of great information that came out of there, but again, it focused on adult and elderly uh, population in particular. So what we need to see is um, more of a pediatric-based um, learning package um, for pediatric falls. Uh, we also need to look at um, how, what we report and how we report and where we report this information to. It's great, and that was one of the things that Accreditation Canada had asked us. It's how do you compare your data with other organizations? And the fact is, is that we don't. Um, we compare them between units and between programs within the IWK, but we don't have a base to report our uh, falls and our fall data. Um, and so that we can compare it with GEO or Sick Kids or Women's and Children's Hospital in BC. So, and CAFTI may be the perfect place for us to uh, report that information and collect that data. 
And this is just an example of our um, assessment record that we did create, and I know you can't see it very well, but um, this um, are some of the things that we collect. Again, it's not a validated tool. Um, we do collect the information on a major risk factors that contribute to falls, um, but we haven't included age as a risk factor or the activity level, which we will be looking at doing. And um, caution record, this is the caution record for uh, individualized safety measures that are implemented for uh, those who are deemed at risk for falls. It does have a start date on when you started those strategies as well as an end date. And any evaluation of those strategies is completed um, uh, uh, in the nursing notes. And this is just one of our um, posters that we have in the waiting areas. So is there um, any questions, or should I turn it over to Tracy or Lisa? That sounds like a, a great segue there, Anita. Thank you so much. Your presentation, for me, just sort of tells me um, how much further we have to go, because you guys have just taken it that extra step in so many different areas. Um, perhaps I will op open the, the floor up for questions and turn to Lisa for a bit of direction, because uh, you can remind people how to uh, ask their questions, and then if they come forward, perhaps uh, we could get on with the conversation. Sure. Um, uh, if you would like to participate in a live question and answer, you can raise your hand and I can unmute your line. To have your line unmuted, uh, you will need to have dialed into the toll-free number and uh, used your audio pin so that I can unmute you, or you'd have to have a working mic. Uh, otherwise, you can just type your questions or your comments into uh, your control panel. So I'm, on, I'm not uh, able to... Uh, to unmute everybody all at once, but uh, but if you raise your hand or or ask a question, so okay. Well, maybe while the question is getting tabled, I could start by asking one of Nita. Sure. Um, Nita, just um, can you just talk a little bit about your definition of a fall or what goes into what's behind the numbers that you're tracking. So, I mean, I know you talked a little bit about activity levels and so on in the actual assessment or future assessments, but in behind the data and how you're tracking it. And the reason why I'm asking is because if we ever wanted to get to a conversation where we could look at um, sharing false data amongst pediatric sites, which I get really excited about the thought of that, you know, weird thought for a Friday, but anyway, um, I would, uh, we'd have to start having those conversations about what do you guys track and what goes behind the actual fall numbers. Mm -hmm. um, we do, um, in, we use as a definition the World Health Organization um, All right, right. definition of falls um, as, um, as our definition for fall. Um, in terms of tracking and what information do we collect, um, there's a number of different um, things within our AIM system, our adverse event reporting system, in terms of what is the age of the child. What was we do ask the questions about activity level. It's not included in the assessment, so age and, and activity level is included in the AIMS report once you a fall happens, but it should be included in the assessment record. So those are two of the things that we collect. We also um, uh, assign a severity rating, so we c collect the information regarding the severity of uh, falls, uh, how much harm was caused to the patient as a result of the fall. Um, we collect, of course, the, the number of falls um, between not only between departments but between programs um, throughout the facility because we have women's health, mental health, um, children's health, and um, others that don't quite fit in there. Um, so we do report on a number of different things. We also, and part of the Safer Healthcare Now, when we did the Falls Prevention Learning Collaborative, we reported in terms of numbers, the rate of falls per thousand inpatient days. And uh, we had collected that for a while during that collaborative, but um, since then that's sort of gone by the wayside. Hmm. So yeah, I have a, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, for further discussions. Um, just even around like assigning severity and so on, of course, that's kind of unique to your facility. So, um, but that being said, I think that there's a really neat opportunity, as you say. Um, Lisa, uh, do you have any more questions? 
Yeah, Tracy, you need, I'm just going to try to unmute somebody here. Uh, Kelly, I'm just going to try to unmute your line, Kelly Wilson, and see if you're, you're able to uh, ask your question. Are you there, Kelly? Okay, so I'll just uh, ask her question for her. Uh, so my name is Kelly Wilson, and I am the Quality Consultant for Falls and Injury Prevention from Interior Health in BC. You're talking about standardized reporting of falls, falls per 1,000 patient days. At Fraser Health in BC, they're reporting injuries per 1,000 patient days. What are your thoughts about focusing on injuries versus falls, and do you have any plans to include injuries in reporting? We do include injuries um, in our, our AIMS, our adverse event reporting system. So if there's any injuries that um, result from the uh, fall, um, it is reported in our system. And that's how, um, when I talked about um, back in the original, um, back a while ago when I was giving you the statistics, we did talk about um, harm, how much harm uh, how many resulted in harm, and those were, and when I talked about fractures or stitches um, as a result of the fall, that's because we do collect that information through our AIM system um, in terms of injuries. In a pediatric population tradition, or, or the majority of falls that do happen in a pediatric uh, population, they don't cause harm to the patient. Um, and even if you look at our stats, um, out of the 68, only eight resulted in harm. And it's, it's, it's not like an adult facility where uh, an adult or an elderly patient, frail patient falls. The risk of harm is far greater in an adult population than it is in a pediatric population. But yes, we do collect um, injuries and injury related, um, related to falls in our AIM system as well. So we could report on that as well, and we do. Hi. That's great. We, um, we, we, we have a category actually that's called accident, injury, or fall. So it would be, for me, it would be teasing out the falls and then looking at the falls with injuries because I'm thinking about injuries that could happen that are not falls, right? So knowing that the focus is is on falls itself, I'd probably say, okay, the biggest scoop at the top would be the falls, and then breaking down those ones, as Nita had mentioned, by injury. And then you could work out some kind of similar rate, or, you know, the severity of the injury and so on. I have a couple more questions here. So at IWK, are you doing uh, your inpatient fall assessments daily or every shift? No, that was a big discussion because originally we had said every shift. Um, but when we we did do um, three PDSA um, studies on uh, before we implemented it, and they just felt that it was too much. A daily assessment plus any time there's a change in condition um, or after a fall, would cover mostly everything, and and we do do daily assessments because a child um, condition can change so much throughout the day, especially if they come in to um, for same day surgery, and they may be not at risk for falls, but once they've had their surgery, then for the next 24 hours they're at risk for falls. But then after that, once their IVs are out, their sedation is gone, or um, they may not be at risk for falls. So we, Within a 48, 24-hour period, they could change drastically. That's why we, we did keep with um, a daily assessment, but we didn't go with by shift um, because, number one, we wanted to get buy-in from the staff, and number one, we wanted compliance. And with a shift, every shift, we felt that there might not be so much compliance, whereas daily, and given the fact that most of the falls happen in the daytime, we thought that um, we do ask them to do it daily, and we ask them to do it first thing in the morning. So that way it keeps staff aware of, of the falls risk, and it also uh, throughout the day. Okay. Uh, uh, Rita, I'm just going to unmute your line if you'd like to ask your question. Hello? Uh, yeah, we can hear you, Rita. Okay. So we're heading into accreditation um, next year, June, 
So we've been working on a fall strategy for a while, but haven't implemented anything just because of the magnitude of, of this type of a project for our organization. What we're um, hearing from both presentations is that there was a significant in, uh, emphasis placed on your ambulatory program. And so I guess I'd like to ask both um, IWK and CHEO what the expectations, what you felt the expectations were from the surveyors. Did they expect that we would be um, assessing using a tool, a risk assessment tool, in all of our ambulatory clinics, or was a more primary prevention approach with a, a solid sort of staff education and family education component sufficient? Hi, it's Tracy. I'll jump in first. Rita, where are you from? From BC Children. Um, the, the surveyor didn't say that we had to use an assessment tool in every one of our clinics. They said we needed a targeted um, a strategy, a, a strategy for targeted populations. So if, um, if you felt that the kids in your, I don't know, nephrology clinic were at a higher risk, that you, how would you assess them? And, and like where would be the focus of your efforts? So, um, so by and large, it wasn't as specific as saying you must use an assessment tool. But the bottom line question was, if you're going to target your efforts for a particular population, how would you be able to tell whether or not they were at risk at fault? So it's, in other words, they were saying, yeah, you need the assessment tool without saying it. Um, but they didn't say it had to be the same one throughout the whole area or that you um, even had to, uh, to do it for a certain number of clinics. It was like, you look at all the ambulatory services that you offer, which ones might be at higher risk for falls and target that population, but then have an overall strategy that takes into consideration your ambulatory care areas. That's how it kind of works from our end. So I know our rehab folk whose kids are probably at a higher risk of falls um, will certainly be looked at closely next time. Right. I guess what we were considering with our rehab population um, was to look at, at saying that they're all high risk in that area. Okay. Yeah. So probably. And then, but then it's the uh, okay. So, uh, if they, if you assume that they're a whole, all high risk, are you developing a separate strategy just for them? Exactly. Well, that there, the approach would be this, the same as what we say we would use in our inpatient areas with high risk patients. Right. So that our strategy would be very focused, and in those clinics, you'd just be much more vigilant, and the strategies you employ would be at a at a different level than than. A, general peace clinic where you might, if the risk isn't as high. Right. So if you, I, I can't see that being problematic, not being a surveyor myself, because you've already assessed that they are high risk. And as long as you're documenting that and, and you've documented whatever your action is, then they should be able to look at every patient's chart and say, oh, that's where they're really paying attention to fall. That's what they're doing. And then that kind of meets that criteria. But I mean, you'd have to definitely articulate that this is our approach in the rehab area. And then, then they would feel that that was enhanced. At least that was from our experience. Uh, Nita, did you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, when the accreditors came here in May, they did look at um, our falls prevention. They were quite happy uh, program. They were quite happy with the inpatient um, assessment record and um, uh, the follow-up and evaluation. But they did take a closer look at the ambulatory areas and what are we doing in terms of fall prevention for the ambulatory areas. And, and like um, we did both do the assumption that all ambulatory areas, all patients within the ambulatory areas are high risk for falls. And given our statistics, that they're at high risk for falls mainly because of environmentally related issues. So we really focused on, and they did ask to see our um, education package that we did. We focused more on education for staff. What are the things that you need to be concerned about within your waiting areas, within your um, exam rooms? So our focus was more on education, and they did want to see that. And um, they also wanted to see, we do have posters up in every ambulatory area and every waiting room, so that, and they did want to see those, and they were looking for those in our ambulatory areas. Um, 
we also, in our falls prevention policy, we include a whole section on ambulatory or ambulatory areas. Um, also, we looked at uh, our monthly workplace inspections and included those in our monthly workplace inspections, so they did take a look at those. And they seemed quite happy with that. Um, they, they weren't looking for a, an, an assessment on every single ambulatory patient. They were more looking in terms of, okay, what's your overall strategy for falls prevention within ambulatory areas? And um, with looking at the education um, that we provide to the staff, as well as um, the evaluation piece or the um, improvement piece that went along with it, they were quite happy with what we had. Thank you. Uh, Rosalie, I'm going to try to unmute you. I'm not sure if you have a mic or not, but I'll try that to start with. And if it doesn't work, I will read your question. Are you there, Rosalie? All righty. So it says, hi, I'm from Edmonton. I work at the Glen Rose Rehab Hospital where we've both peds and adult geriatric units. I've taken the Canadian Falls Prevention Curriculum, which if you're not familiar with, uh, was developed as an approach to falls uh, with a geri uh, falls prevention with a geriatric perspective. It has a definition for falls that we're hoping would be used across the country. My question around this is the approach of the curriculum is to look at the risk factors based on not the traditional intrinsic, extrinsic delineation, but looking at biological, behavioral, socioeconomic, and environmental. In our approach for falls risks, cognitive issues don't exactly capture all of the behavioral risks like impulsivity. Socioeconomic risk factors can also be considered, uh, consider whether the client family have enough education to understand our teaching? Can they read our handouts? Do they have the money to purchase the right shoes, et cetera? And has Accreditation Canada commented on what's in the assessment? Could we consider expanding the curriculum? So that's all pretty interesting. And yeah. actually, I mean, it's something that would be worth bringing forward to Accreditation Canada. I don't know if they've done that. Um, or certainly we have that, a link from a pediatric perspective to Accreditation Canada. And I think that they were, were going to involve them in future teleconferences this year. It would mm -hmm. be a neat kind of uh, question, maybe a, a sort of an open mic or an open forum thing to put forth to them. Yeah, I think uh, some, some really interesting points. Yeah. And the curriculum it is great, and it does um, take into a lot greater things like the impulsivity and uh, when they talk about cognitive um, ability. So yeah, that would be a great um, place to start and work with too. And uh, just a reminder to everybody that uh, this presentation is being recorded and it will be posted on Cassie's Knowledge Exchange Network. So we'll post the entire recorded presentation plus the um, uh, uh, PowerPoint slides. And I'll send a link to everybody in the next day or so. Okay. So is that it for questions? Ah, uh, that looks like that's it so far. Yes. Well, I think that that's a good opportunity to maybe pull, call it a wrap then. The, um, I just wanted to say thank you in particular to Nita and our friends at IWK because you have given us lots of uh, really interesting food for thought going forward. And I think that... Um, this topic uh, is one that we can actually come back and revisit with some of the questions that Nita kind of left us for about a potential role for CAPC in developing um, the data that we use and just sort of developing even the strategy for false prevention for kids because clearly the kids aren't on the radar as much as they should be for this particular topic and it's something that we can all stand to learn from. Uh, a final note, I just wanted to um, let everybody know that if you didn't have the opportunity to attend the CAFC Patient Safety, well, actually the CAFC Conference, but in particular the past CAFC Patient Safety uh, Annual Symposium um, at CAFC in October, we had a really great um, attendance and, and uh, some super presentations, in particular from Dr. Ann Matlow around the Canadian Pediatric Adverse Events Study. And then um, Dr. Michael Gardam talked about improving patient safety through frontline empowerment uh, and uh, really kind of had us all um, 
revved up and motivated moving forward. So um, if you are interested in learning more about those particular uh, presentations, we can certainly find a way to bring that one back onto our future CAFT patient safety agenda. Um, any other final thoughts, Lisa or Nina? Uh, actually, there's another uh, question here. It says, will you share the materials that have been developed by the different sites? So I know I will put the presentations up, and the contact information for both uh, Tracy and Nita are on those uh, presentations. Sure. So we'll, uh, if, if there's something specific that you want, I'm pretty sure that they would be happy to uh, connect with you. So. Most definitely. Okay, well, thanks, everyone. Uh, have a great uh, weekend. Hope you get some Christmas shopping done or holiday shopping wherever you might be. And uh, we'll touch base again in December, just before the holidays.